Murphy. Um, we are talking about Bitcoin's revenge that I think that is a pretty complicated term. I think for us, Web3 is so much more than just Bitcoin price, right? It's so Bitcoin price and Bitcoin volatility brings us the opportunities and the opportunities to develop the, the ideas that we have. So my very first intro question to you is what is exciting you guys in the Web3 space currently? Uh, and how does it correlate with the Bitcoin's price, obviously? Yeah, I can, I yeah. can start off. Um, yeah, it's funny being here at Web Summit. I've gotten some questions about, you know, now AI is the darling. Web3 is sort of in, in the back room or, you know, Bitcoin's revenge coming back this year. I've been in the industry for 11 years now, and I've seen this movie before. <laughs> you know, there's peaks and valleys uh, to different cycles, and a lot of it's tied to Bitcoin halving, which is just upcoming. But if we zoom out, what's exciting to me is over the longer arc of time, we're seeing growth and maturity in Web3. And uh, I think a lot of that and what's really exciting about this latest cycle to me is real institutional adoption. If you think about it, some of the biggest brands in financial services like Goldman and BlackRock and Fidelity, they actually built their products and offerings in bear markets, meaning they see the bigger picture at hand. So I think that's what's going to be really different about this year is the institutional embrace and, and takeoff. I can sympathize with this a lot. As, as a journalist, like institutional adoption news are not less exciting uh, than any other adoption uh, news yet. What is exciting you? I mean, the thing that really excites me about Web3 is what it's actually doing for financial inclusion. Uh, that's always been the narrative, but we're really seeing effect of that, particularly in Web3 gaming. When you look at places like the Philippines or even in some places in Latin America, you know, millions of people in the world who don't have a bank account, don't have university education, in some cases don't even have high school education. But now, through having a crypto wallet, they are included in a new financial ecosystem, are becoming somewhat financial literate taught through gaming, which is another form of play, and basically are partaking in all these opportunities. And, and to me, that's, I think, sort of the promise of Web3. Because to me, actually, to be fully in Web3, you have to be somewhat financially literate. And I think the other thing that really excites us with all the investments we make as Animoca as well in Web3 is that I also think it infuses a new purpose and meaning to capitalism. But I think particularly in the last couple of years, capitalism has become, in many cases, a, a negative word. And I think it's been intertwined with sort of the crypto space. But actually, capitalism is the engine of growth. It's how we have innovation and creativity. And once people get a touch of that, you know, it's like when you're in the Web3 sort of world and you've touched that and tasted it, you never want to come out. It's the same when you actually understand money. It's the same when you understand capitalism. And I think basically that's, that's one of the sort of superpowers of Web3 as well. Web3 is super relatable. It's about giving power to people who didn't have access to certain things uh, without the tech that Web3 is providing. So obviously on the institutional level with the Bitcoin ETF, the ETH ETF that was just uh, approved in Hong Kong uh, yesterday, this is very exciting and this is something that brings more attention. How do you see these big events this year, along with the halving that is also coming up uh, in a few days, how do you see the, these trends being developed in terms of institutional adoption in general and in terms of retail adoption? Yes. Uh, so at Ripple, we have focused our entire business all along on institutions. So we've been at it for many years, uh, working with primarily banks and other types of payment companies around the world to use blockchain as a, as a layer or uh, a new infrastructure to make um, global money movement a lot more efficient. And we certainly have noticed in the past you know, few quarters here a much stronger lean-in from banks around the world in markets where the government has provided clarity of how to regulate crypto assets, like here in Brazil. There's certainly a much stronger liftoff. Hong Kong be another key market in that regard. I think one of the things that's interesting is that we're not done yet with spot ETFs, broadly speaking. Right, meaning that Bitcoin spot ETF is going to be emerging in other markets. So Hong Kong just recently came in together with Ethereum spot ETF, first one in the world, I would say. Then there's Singapore, there's Tokyo, there's London, there's Europe. You know, a lot of, lot of uh, financial sort of um, institutions I'm talking about are like, why should the U.S. have all the fun, right? So they basically all sort of want you to engage with that, and I think we're just going to have an impact. 
But I think also, you know, um, you know, CF Benchmarks, for instance, recently actually issued a GameFi index, right? And the GameFi index obviously is not an ETF yet, but they basically put a basket of 20 gaming-related tokens, which basically is just the beginning of another level of institutionalization. Because of course, these tokens don't trade millions. They trade hundreds of millions of dollars a day. I mean, like Ripple, for instance, as well. You could totally imagine that Ripple would also maybe be an ETF, right? There's ways in which these systems are included. So, so now the institutional adoption gives it that credibility. And of course, the regulators can no longer ignore it. Some of them want to, and actually the ones who don't and actually are afford are winning. So in the case of Hong Kong, you know, most people wouldn't even utter the word Web3 in Hong Kong two, three years ago, right? It was like, Hong Kong, Web3, who cares? And today, it's synonymous to Web3 almost, right? It's Dubai, Hong Kong, like it's the competition between those two places as the leading centers, and it's made it hip again. So again, I think this is true for all these places that want to sort of contend for leadership in this next era of uh, fintech and finance. Obviously, institutional adoption brings more regulation, and it definitely serves to protect and serves to regulate this pretty messy uh, market that we've had before. At the same time, I think a lot of OGs, they are pretty skeptical about uh, what's the next for crypto because some of, some of the community think that the golden years of uh, Bitcoin and crypto are gone along with the upcoming regulation. So let's be optimistic here. What, why do you think regulation is important? Why do you think that even along with the regulation, the original values of crypto are here to stay? And what does it mean for uh, countries, communities, and different backgrounds that are maybe not in the headlines, but rather um, on the on the edge of the financial world, what does it mean for them? Well, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So, I mean, first, you know, our focus with Animoca Brands has always been on more the cultural side, right? And I think for us, we think that culture is the most important aspect of any community and any any society and any economy in the world. But right? if you think about how much you spend on culture in your own life, where you live, your clothes you wear, the watch you buy you know, things you buy for your friends and family. This actually is all cultural in context, and it's social. Right? You buy them to signify your social status, not necessarily in terms of rank, but just in terms of meaning, for instance. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, being uh, sort of, I guess, in, in Web3 terms, I, I consider culture the deepest TVL of any economy, right? <laughs> An economy that doesn't have culture doesn't have depth, right? Uh, and, you know, for instance, with Bitcoin, Ordinals was the introduction of that. In fact, I've become much more bullish on Bitcoin because of Ordinals, because it transcended this pure idea of a store of value, because now it can also have stores of culture. And I think this is, to me, the, the bigger growth narrative over time, because we, you know, we listen to music, we watch movies, we, we invest in cultural assets, um, and culture can become an asset class. Whereas the regulators, to your question, is really much more around giving safety to the space. But they're not necessarily going to regulate NFTs. Right? They just want to make sure that people aren't doing scams and all that kind of stuff. And that, to me, is just part of the maturation of the market. And I'll close with one other thought, which is that, you know, this is, you know, capitalism at work. And there is a degree of volatility that exists in capitalism, period, right? Because if it wasn't, you know, if the, capitalism is a proxy for change. So, um, you know, if you didn't have capitalism, you wouldn't have Tesla. You wouldn't have disruptive innovations. You wouldn't have changes in society. Right? So I think what you see in Web3 and why it seems volatile is because it's on-chain. So the pricing and the movement you see all the time. But in reality, that's life. Life is volatile. I mean, just think about how many times you know, people lose their jobs every day and how many times people get a new job every day. We see an index that says 3% of the world or 4% of people are unemployed, fine. But it's not 4% unemployed as a stable line. It's like this, right? How many businesses shut down every day and open every day, right? That's capitalism. And so in Web3, we just see it as a data point every day, and so it feels volatile, but I actually think it's just the flavor of capitalism. I think um, to, the, to the key point of is regulation orthogonal with the original purpose and mission behind cryptocurrency and blockchains, which to, to me it means an internet of value, it means greater inclusion, more access for more people, more affordable financial services. I'm coming at it from a financial services lens. And I, I really strongly believe, I, I think a lot of us in the industry believe that clear regulation will accelerate the long-term vision 
because it's about applying sensible rules and frameworks uh, to make sure that you know transacting, storing value on chain is safe, secure, resilient. Um, these are important things to make the the chain underlying a, a application or service make it actually useful and usable to a broad population of people. And going, yeah, you started off talking about it. You're excited about the inclusion implications of this work that we're doing, and I think that is what why a lot of people have gravitated toward the Web three space. And I think that that vision can only come to light with sensible regulation. Your favorite use case? In My Web3. favorite use case. I've always, I've always really bought into the idea that payments can be the killer use case for blockchain. It's super simple. If you think of the inherent attributes of a blockchain, it's a global network out of the box. It's a place where you can represent value and then really seamlessly move it around the world in a very transparent way. Um, and, and, you, and you can have proof of the transaction settlement within seconds in many cases. And so if, if anyone has sent money internationally, this is an international crowd, it's slow, it's expensive, you don't know if your money reached the destination, you don't know what your all-in costs are. It just seems like it, this is not how it should work in the year 2024. Uh, so I'm still a really strong believer that payments can be a, starting, a great starting point for Broader, to really redesign and modernize the financial industry more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I would normally say gaming, which is, of course, a big use case because of digital property rights and because of the fact that, you know, there's 3 billion gamers in the world who still don't own their assets. But um, I think the narrative for 2024, I think the bigger, bigger use case that I think will bring mass adoption that I think is really exciting is airdrops. And I don't mean airdrops in the context of, hey, get some free tokens because you're basically sort of doing chain farming or whatever but rather the context of what airdrops represents, right? For instance, in our industry in gaming, we spend over $100 billion advertising video games. But what do we do? We advertise so that people can join our games. And who do we pay? We pay Apple and Google and Facebook and all these platforms, these billions of dollars. And you do this for all sorts of advertising. But how much of that value that we pay Apple and Google actually goes back to the gaming industry? Basically nothing, right? Um, Apple doesn't invest in games. Facebook doesn't sort of give money to gamers, right? So, but we're spending money to acquire gamers. But what happens with airdrops is that we're actually not paying Apple money, we're paying the gamers money. And we're actually giving value to the gamers. And so the, what excites me is that, you know, many gamers don't understand this, but when you pay a gamer or your target audience, you know, basically value to engage with an ecosystem, the chances that they put back into the ecosystem is way, way higher mm. than, than paying it to a third-party advertising agency who basically doesn't care about your product. He just basically is taking a big tax for being the middleman, right? And that to me, you know, like in the last three years, not including 24, because there's a lot more, over $21.7 billion was passed to users in the form of airdrops. I mean, that is an insane amount of value that's given to consumer engagement. That's more money than Spotify pays out. That's more money than Facebook. All of you who use Instagram, how much has Instagram paid you for using Instagram? The answer is, of course, zero, right? Right? And that, to me, is actually one of the most powerful use cases because at the end of the day, you, the end user, are actually giving value to the network. You're creating network effects. So why shouldn't you get value? So I would say that certainly the near-term narrative, sort of the airdrop mechanism, which is probably maybe sounds wrong because it's like, oh, you're just giving it for free. But it's not free. We spend money on marketing and advertising every day when we launch a product. We just are not paying it to the platform. We're paying it to the users who actually should get it anyway. Yet you're representing both side of the creator and of the investor. So how do these two visions coincide and how do they differ? And how we as an industry can guarantee that the investments go into those original values of the Web3 creative economy that we've been discussing right here? So first... Anything related to investing has risk, which means that there is a little bit of you have to understand how you're investing, which projects you do it. So even when you think about NFT projects, some do really well because you know that the creators are serious and some unfortunately don't do well. And that is no different than people selling products in the early days or startups launching you know, companies. And so it's a cycle of things where over time you build reputation. But the thing about Web3 is in on-chain reputation, really that's all you have. Right? If you basically start to burn your reputation, you're done to the world, right? And that's why I think that in time, basically, 
I think reputation systems like ID systems are, are really important because you're not going to support something of someone that you don't know. But I would say there's another point about Web3 which I'm so excited about, which is I think of every person as a creator. Like we, sometimes we try to distinguish creators and users, but I don't think that's the case because every person who's using Instagram is a creator, right? You're spending, maybe it's not the same kind of creativity. Maybe you're not a musician. Maybe you don't know how to paint, but you're still being creative in your function. There were some studies that showed that children are born creative. The majority of children are born creative. And it's only over time after going through school and the education system and everything that you actually lose your creativity. In fact, you know, 91% of children can solve problems creatively based on the study. And by the time they're adults, only 2% stay creative, right? Which is kind of similar to when you think about entrepreneurship as a ratio, right? But in Web3, we can finally actually fully embrace our creativity in multiple diverse ways, which, which to me is the necessary superpower because classic labor is not necessary with AI, right? The work of our minds is going to be more valuable than our physical labor, for instance, right? And the work of our minds is anyway creative in nature. So I think of Web3 as empowering not just creators, but everyone, because we're all creators. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. Imagine if you can be part of it, right? This, this is the, the, the credo of this, this industry. We've discussed inclusion a lot. Diversity is also a big part of the, this industry that is managed by this decentralized nature, right? Uh, Monica, you've been very active on this diversity front, and I'm really happy also that we are here on this stage, so different from different countries. Uh, how do you see Web3 enabling this diversity in the financial institutions as well? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned, you know, I've been a part of the industry for more than a decade, right. and I can say over time, I definitely see uh, more uh, women and people of color getting involved. Um, in more places around the world as well. So I do see the, the mix of people who are building and creating in Web3, um, that complexion changing over time. Um, and I think that, you know, similarly in the world of, of finance, it's seeing more of a, a broadening of, uh, you know, the people who are getting involved. So I think there's lots of opportunities. I think also use cases expanding to things like creation and gaming and arts um, has also brought in new groups of people. I mean, I, would, I want to add one comment also that pre-Web3, um, uh, so the technology companies out of Vietnam or Philippines mm. or Latin America would not normally have the VC opportunities. It was usually around Silicon Valley or the U.S. And Web3 companies all the way from all over the world that would not normally receive funding are all magnets and targets for this. So again, the diversity extends uh, into basically multiple countries around the world. And cultures. If you haven't done it yet, join Web3. This is for everyone. This is open source and uh, very friendly. Last question. Bitcoin price by the end of the year? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure by the end of the year, although I think it's possible that in my mind it'll break over 100,000. But I do believe that Bitcoin can reach a million dollars plus over time. But I believe it not because it's a store of value, because it will become maybe one of the most important status symbols of the digital economy in the future? I, I would say the more important place for us all to focus is on real-world utility for the assets, and that's what's going to drive long-term value and stability and, and liquidity for all the assets in crypto. But I, I will say, like, for Brazil, this is a place where we are seeing a really ripe ground for that kind of development. You have a government that has embraced and given clarity around virtual assets. You have a vibrant developer community, and you have traditional finance banks like Itaú embracing it. So that, that's the mixture of uh, the, the, the right breeding ground for crypto. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Brazil. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.